I'm Joseph, and this is the Catacombic Machine podcast. In today's episode, Matt Baker and Preston Price talks to Anne Yunte about his book, The Decolonial Abyss, Mysticism and Cosmopolitics from the Ruins, published in 2016 by Fordham University Press. The central question Yunte raises is, how do we mediate the mystical abyss of theology and the abyss of socio-political trauma engulfing the colonial subject? What would theopoetics look like in the context where poetics is the means of resistance and survival? This book seeks to answer these questions by examining the abyss as the dialectical process in which the self's dispossession before the encounter with its own finitude is followed by the rediscovery or reconstruction of the self. In the upcoming episode, Yunte raises a common critique aimed at Deleuze and Guattari Namely, that their abstract level of thinking allows for them to be exploited by virtually anyone. And he is then quoted from the decolonial abyss. The question that arises is, should not the call for accountability and mourning for the loss and suffering of others precede the joyful celebration of freedom and nomadic ontology? Should not the question of the other be at the center of ethics rather than a preoccupation with the self's endless becomings? End quote. I believe that this is an unfruitful dichotomy. Contrary to Yunti, I would describe the preoccupation with our endless becomings as a deeply ethical endeavor. I would also go as far as to say that we're all colonized, in the sense that we are all nailed down as subjects. By that statement, I do not mean that we all benefit equally from the current set of folds. We clearly do not. But it is my way of saying that no one can simply escape organization as such. Hence, I am convinced that ethics cannot be reduced to fetishizing victims of colonization or oppression as if they could somehow save us all. This all too common fixation among self-flagellating progressives is not the solution, rather it coagulates the behavioral, intellectual and institutional habits that enforces the pressure on all colonized subjects, including themselves. Rather than pitting the preoccupation with the self's endless becomings against accountability and mourning for the loss and suffering of others, my claim is that joyfully affirming one's own difference is exactly how we make an ethical life possible, since by simply accepting our ready-made identities we keep reproducing the habits that made the world what it is, if our aim is to transform the world. We should not demand from people who have suffered deep socio-political traumas to remembering themselves by putting the pieces of their tragic past together to be able to imagine a new future. In my mind, this would in effect result in a kind of repetition with no difference, a deathly repetition. Rather, I believe that the preoccupation with the self's endless becomings is precisely how we assume accountability for the loss and suffering of others. To what extent Yunte and I disagree on this issue is not clear to me at all. I have yet to read The Decolonial Abyss, so I cannot say if he addresses this in more detail in his writings. I do think, however, that this is a conversation worthy of further attention. Now, here is Matt Baker and Preston Price talking to Anne Yunte. Enjoy. So we were talking before and you mentioned that you live in California. What are you up to out there these days? Oh yeah, I was teaching for the past three years at uh, Lebanon Valley College in central Pennsylvania. And this summer, oh, last spring, I accepted a a new position at uh, California State University Northridge. So as of fall 2017, I am teaching at the Religious Studies department over at Cal State Northridge in LA. You mentioned like quickly in the book that you 
uh, spent some time in Argentina, but I also know that you're Korean. So like, help us with that. Where, where did you grow up? What was that like? Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, we, my family is originally from Korea and I was born in Seoul, but they, uh, my parents moved to Argentina when, when I was little. So I grew up in Buenos Aires and my family is still there. Um, so it's the place that I consider home, hometown. Uh, it was quite an interesting experience. I, I grew up speaking Spanish and Korean at home. And uh, so, yeah, I grew up bilingual, you know, and, and, and that Argentinian culture, which is oddly sort of old school European and also Latin American at the same time. Uh, so I got that going on uh, and I moved to the States. I came to the States when I was 23. And so I have that double, triple, you know, consciousness thing going on in my, in my mind. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, how do you normally, how would you self-identify when you think about yourself? Right. You know, what's, what comes to the, to the top there? I mean, the, I guess the right answer to that question would be that I identify myself with all the three cultures. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't necessarily exclude any one of them from who I am, but, um, for the most part, culturally speaking, I identify with the with Argentinian culture uh, the most, more than anything. Probably okay. because that was the, the most informative, I mean, formative years of my life. So what is it about Argentinian culture that, I mean, besides living in there and breathing the, the air and drinking the water and, getting, and being versed in the language, that really draws you to say that that is your cultural home that is your your place of origins in a sense that is your identity right i mean i believe this is true for every culture but argentina has is a very distinctively unique uh cultural flavor you know in in the way that people express uh themselves and and that is like i said it's one culture that really stands out um, to the point that when you tell, you know, other people from Latin America that, from, that you're from Argentina, you know, people sort of put up this, you know, smile on their face, you know, and who knows what that implies, you know, mm -hmm. it means so many different things. But, but one thing that's clear to it is that it's, it's got a very uh, uniquely distinctive uh, culture going on. And that's so deeply ingrained in who I am, that uh, no matter what, you know, language or culture I acquire, you know, as an adult, uh, it just, everything is filtered through that Argentinian-ness, which is, you know, again, <laughs> I keep repeating myself, very unique. Did you grow up in a religious uh, family? Like, what was your religious background? Were you involved yeah, in yeah, my parents were... Uh, kind of a stereotypical Korean evangelical immigrant church goers. So I grew up going to church, a Korean church in Buenos Aires, which, uh, you know, church for, in, for immigrant communities is not just a church. It's not just a Sunday thing, right? It's sort of the, the center of social and cultural life. And uh, that's where you really are shaped uh, and you learn not only language and culture, but also I could almost say that that's where I, I, I sort of the main sort of lens through which I, I was looking at the world was uh, shaped in so many ways. Yeah. So I, I grew up in an evangelical Protestant family. Yeah. I mean, that's something I can relate to. We were actually just talking about this before you jumped on you know, being really involved in the church kind of mm -hmm. gr growing up and it was the center of our family's life and that sort of right. thing. I'm not sure how, f I mean, of course it's formative, but I'm, I'm not sure, you know, in terms of uh, cult cultural value, how much of that sort of carries through. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, no, like in retrospect, right? Uh, I, I, I was, when I said it was really formative, it was up until I went to college. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking at me when I was back, you know, 17, eight years old, 18 years old, church was just everything, right? It, it was just the beginning and the end. It was the <laughs> center of my life pretty much. Hmm. Uh, but up to that point, and then once I went to college and once I took off, then, you know, it's a totally different story. 
do you think that uh, that is maybe where some of your, I mean, it's stereotypical in the States to have that college story being a place of a testing ground for one's faith. Do you think that maybe, did that you have, did you have any kind of experience like that where your kind of your fundamental beliefs or principles of Christianity were tested and changed in some way? Oh yeah. Yeah. First year of college, you know, up front, <laughs> up front. It didn't even take a semester, just like first month into it. <laughs> and I was going through that crisis. Yeah. And that, and that pretty awful breakup you know <laughs> yeah right right how do, um do you mind going into like how that the kind of shape that took i mean what were the questions you were asking at that point oh no i i don't know it was ironically it was a a a hebrew bible or or old testament course that i was taking from a a professor who was actually oddly conservative and evangelical who didn't even subscribe to the to what do you call it? um historical criticism hmm. so hmm. in a way he was sort of like a literalist but of course he would teach you know all this stuff about document hypothesis and and critical readings of of bible even though he kept saying that that was just all wrong you got to be familiar with this stuff enough just to kind of push it aside right right and also I was taking a bunch of philosophy courses, history courses, and I was just like digging into all this philosophy and theology books that I could barely understand back then. I guess I realized that there was something going on that I was completely uh, blind, unaware of up to that mo moment. It was almost like this conspiracy theory, you know, like, it's like opening up a whole new door and you realize that just like a wall that's much bigger out there, you know, and you're like, really? <laughs> right. <laughs> so if we were to sort of like, you know, thread together those formative years in, in Argentina where your, your parents were, uh, your immigrants, you're an immigrant family, and then your kind of the beginning of your studies where you're having these, um, these kind of eye-opening insights in your studies and that sort of thing. Like, at what point did that point you towards the decolonial aspect of your thinking? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Uh, I don't think I really started to think much about the issue of colonialism or coloniality until my third year of college. I joined this reading group it was all students right there was this no there was no faculty involved it was just like a group of students uh coming together to study critical thinking and philosophy and then we're reading Foucault, Deleuze you know these are like 20 years old kids who have never read Foucault <laughs> or Deleuze we're reading it on our own you know right with a bunch of obviously commentaries and, and secondary sources and then we uh delved into Said and Fanon. And that was the sort of eye-opening moment where I sort of uh, was able to bring these this pieces together and also reflect on my own experience of growing up in a country where I was a racial ethnic minority. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's when things started to make a whole lot of sense and, and sort of, you know, opened uh, a whole new door. Right. I guess my interest has always been in the way that uh, ways of thinking and knowing, to use a fancy word, right, the epistemological framework is colonized, right? The way that uh, coloniality dominate, not dominates, but uh, controls, classifies, uh, and, and categorize and frames the way that we look and think uh, and produce knowledge and relate to others. You have written a book and it's, I mean, it's what, a couple years ago? No. Uh, it was published, it came out last year. Okay. Um, and it's called The Decolonial Abyss. And if we sort of maybe just begin with that title, because mm -hmm. I, think, I think it might be fair to say that the, fi the book turns on this figure of the abyss. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think this is important for people to understand what you're up to, because mm -hmm. it's what allows you, I think, to weave together these different 
mm -hmm. areas of inquiry. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you could just give us a short survey of right. the abyss, sort of tracing its uh, like historical and philosophical contours and why, and why that's important for you. Mm -hmm. I think uh, to begin with the title, I think the, the, the decolonial abyss is meant to uh, signify two different meanings. One is to decolonize the figure of the abyss, which has been very much appropriated, at least in the field of philosophy and philosophical theology by highly speculative uh, metaphysical discourses. And then I guess the second meaning that's uh, implicated there is the trauma of colonial existence, right? The trauma, the indelible trauma that uh, the abyss that's opened up for the being whose horizon of existence unfolds upon the matrix of death. The abyss is highly elusive, you know, figure. It's in a way everywhere, but it's really nowhere. It's almost rarely uh, thematized or theorized. So I had a, quite a bit of a struggle there. But what I was ultimately trying to look at through the figure of the abyss is the, um, and, and obviously here, <laughs> by trying to nail down what I'm trying to do in this book in a sentence, I'm taking the risk of, you know, reducing, <laughs> simplifying what I'm up to. One way of, of putting it is that the abyss in a way represents the, the in-between, the space, the middle of indeterminacy that refuses uh, both poles, right? A, a teleological closure. And this idea uh, is all over, right? Uh, if you look at the history of Western philosophy and theology going all the way back to Plato. Uh, and again, some people do use uh, the term, the abyss explicitly. In many cases, they don't. Uh, so a lot of my reading is in one way or another constructive um, I guess what the abyss does in the different figures that I'm looking at is, and this is uh, one of the central cons uh, points of concern, right, that's driving my book. I guess I've been always sort of fascinated by the dialectics of the self. And let me unpack that. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm sort of, really intrigued by the way that in the different thinkers who are grappling with negativity, be, be that a philosopher or theologian, you, you sort of see this tendency of the self that is, you know, coming to terms with negation, who is sort of agonizing desperately in the face of his, her limit or finitude who suddenly, you know, takes this live to a, almost like a heroic construction of itself, you know, the self who sort of goes through this negation and emerges, rises up in an almost like a triumphant way. So I was sort of curious at that, about that resilience. Like, what is it? Like, what happens in between, right? We, you see the mystics, the philosophers and political thinkers who on the one hand are talking about this, this desperate you know, agony, despair, loss, and pain of the self who is self, you know, dispossessed. And then all of a sudden you have this sort of hopeful, you know, account of the rebirth or recreation, reconstruction of the self who emerges now as a new subject with new consciousness. So, so the abyss in a way sort of, to me, um, takes a pause there and, and says, wait, wait a minute, you know, there's a tendency to gravitate towards the poles, right? It's either the negative or positive, defeat or triumph, you know, total self-dispossession or full realized, actualized self, imminence or transcendence, divine or human or creaturely, right? And, and so in a way, the abyss sort of turns the, the, our attention to the middle, 
to the middle. The, the middle that's not just a, a stepping stone towards, again, the, the teleological closure, but the middle that, that has life of its own. Yeah, and you're critical of, you talk about Zizek, you know, following Hegel, and that's, I think, one of the criticisms you have of Zizek is sort of his enthusiasm, which is kind of a weird thing to say mm-hmm. uh, of Zizek, you know, right. or sorry, his, his optimism. In right. Sure, you know, uh, not many people would call Zizek an optimist, right? If anything, he's a pessimist. Um, but at the same time, uh, the, 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 the kind of political subject that Zizek uh, rehab, rehabilitates is, in a way, from my perspective, um, very optimist. And, and, and here I kind of follow uh, Judith Butler's uh, critique of Zizek's resilient subject, right? Who, despite, you know, and, 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 and again, there's, there's not that many people in, who is writing uh, these days uh, who emphasizes the negative as much as Zizek does, right? So for Zizek, it's, it's the negative, it's, it's all about the negative, the negative that tears you apart, the negative that crushes you down, right? The negative that sort of destroys, completely annihilates yeah. the, 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 the naive subject, right? Mm-hmm. But, but he wants to negate the negation very quickly. No? Right, exactly. And, and then like this traumatic event that like, Throws you, throws you, you know, uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, throws you off. But then all of a sudden, you know, you just all of a sudden have this really uh, oddly, you know, miraculously uh, triumphant uh, sort of subject, newly reconstructed subject who is emerging out of that vortex that he emphasizes so much. Which, you know, gives a lot of hope, right? I, I see where he's going, right? He's, he's got a very clear, you know, political sort of goal and agenda that, you know, is grounded in, in, in real politics oftentimes. So I, I see what, what that does. And, I, and there are certain aspects of it that I, I appreciate. But, but again, what, what, what's happening there? Like how does the, the you know, tra- traumatized subject uh, how is it able to to reconstruct itself? What happens there, right? Um, and, and, and Butler, who is also, you know, uh, a reader of Hegel and who is also very much preoccupied with the negative in, in Hegel, takes a, a different route, right? Who sort of says, well, well wait a minute, you know. <laughs> uh, isn't Zizek sort of moving on too fast, right? It's w- without leaving, giving the subject uh, the time to mourn the loss, right? Which in early Hegel uh, is, is really prominent, right? If you go through um, phenomenology of, of spirit, uh, it, it's, it's, it's all about, especially the first parts of the book, you know, Hegel just cannot emphasize enough uh, the power of, of negativity, right? And, and he even talks about the, the, the unhappy consciousness, how, you know, one is sort of dealing with complete loss of a world, right, of the gods. Uh, and, but then yet, you know, Hegel sort of does makes the same move in a way. And that is the reason why I, I attribute um, Zizek's tendency to move on too quickly to Hegel, because in a way Hegel does that, right? That, that traumatizing, that sort of, you know, um, formidable, that um, terrifying uh, abyss of the negative sort of disappears. It's, it's sort of sublated in, in that progressive cycle of, of the dialectic. I was wondering about the implications there between moving on too quickly and staying within the negativity. Um, mm. Mikhail, what would you see as like the implications of, or the consequences of moving on too quickly in terms of the subject who is negated and then trying to negate that negation too quickly versus staying within the middle. Yeah, well, thank you. I think that is really what's been driving uh, 
me to write the book in so many ways. Of course, I'm not sure if I am addressing, fully addressing or, address, or answering that question in my book. I think it's a work in progress, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and to be quite honest with you, I don't think I have an, a quick and easy answer uh, to that. And, and my problem is precisely the fact that in political philosophy, political theology, uh, different sort of, you know, branches of social theory, uh, there's a tendency to sort of move on too quickly, right? That we, we want to have a solution. We want to have some kind of recipe, some kind of prescription for the... The, the subject that's traumatized. Of course, we don't want to dwell in melancholia and, and loss forever, right? That's, that's, right. It's that's like we're too quick to uh, move on. And put, to put it in Christian terms, we're too quick to move on from Good Friday and the, the Saturday that follows. And we want to get the Easter Sunday. We want that resurrection because right. it, it's too hard for us. We're too neurotic in those two days leading up right. to Resurrection Sunday, I guess. Right, right. So yeah, like we don't want to dwell, you know, in, in that Saturday forever, but at the same time, we, we got to find a fine balance to not move too quickly to, to the glorious, right, uh, reconstructed subject. And, and honestly, I don't see this as a uh, sort of A to B kind of movement, as one thing that, you know, gets you from this point to the other. It's to the way that I, I guess I envision it's more spiral, right? It's kind of like the abyss, you know, Closure leads to opening, and opening leads to closure. Right? It's it's not yeah. a one thing that that moves you to the next stage, and then you move on. But it's always a constant sort of loop, right? Yeah, and I, I find value in staying in the middle of things and getting in that dialectic of the uh, the closure and the opening of the abyss, mm -hmm. and looking at, and staying within trauma long enough to actually maybe analyze that trauma to a deeper extent. Um, but I'm wondering, um, from your perspective, why it is you're you, you like to be insistent upon this idea of staying in the middle, of staying with the trauma, of staying within this dialectic of opening and closure and closure and opening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I think it's because it generates, depending on how you grapple with that middle, with trauma, right? I think it definitely ends up generating uh, totally different accounts of political subjectivity and action, hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So one that we see coming out of someone like Zizek, who, you know, whose politics, well, actually, <laughs> let me take that back. <laughs> let me not make any comment about Zizek's politics. <laughs> but anyways, uh, who's, who's, you know, again, whose theory of Marxist revolutionary subject is, is great and it's motivating. It's, it's, you know, inspiring. But then at the same time, you know, do people who are, grab, who are dealing with, struggling with this indelible, trauma that's been ingrained historically, but it's also something that's constantly going on in the present. They demand a different kind of politics, different kind of poetics, different kind of theory that cannot be uh, reduced to sort of this revolutionary idea of political subjectivity, like the ones that the Zizek is. Well, there's this kind of theme, I think, also, like, I was just kind of thinking when you were just talking now about uh, th that indeterminacy of where there's kind of, there's the closure in the opening and, and vice versa, it sort of moves back and forth. There's this sort of oscillation there between the poles, perhaps we can say, but mm -hmm. I think that maybe connects to this figure of, it's a guy I never heard of him before, Glissant. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the, the several kind of key figures in the negritude movement you you make reference to, but he's I mean, my, my take is he's sort of the central interlocutor in your, in your work. And, uh, and I think there might be others who aren't familiar with him. And so maybe you can say something about him. Like, what do we need to know and how he figures into your, what you want to do here? Yeah. So to me, Glissant here uh, sort of proposes a, a form of a mode of writing and thinking, which is also a form of poetics, right? That is, that sort of brings this pieces uh, that are otherwise separated together. Politics, the political, theological, mystical, the secular, politics, poetics, right? 
uh, revolution and dealing with trauma, these things that seem to sort of be in separate, in sort of dichotomy, right? Uh, in, in the writing of Glissant, he sort of brings those, all of them together. And, and what, I, what I see happening there, obviously it's, it's complex and it's, it's you know, vast, the body of literature. But the thing that really interests me the most is sort of the way that he grapples with the past, with memory, with historical trauma. Because sort of going back to that, you know, uh, binary of do you want to stay, do you want to stay in, you know, Saturday forever or move on and sort of, you know, get to Easter? Glissan sort of breaks that, that binary, right? And to be clear, Glissan is not a, a religious thinker. He doesn't know anything about uh, religion in, in an explicit way at all. But, but he sort of incorporates this sort of way of constantly writing about the past, but he's always looking at the future. So there's a, a really fascinating way of breaking that binary. It's, it's either you're looking at the future or you're looking, you're sort of stuck in the past. And that's my critique of Rosie Braidotti in my Glissant chapter, where she actually misuses, in my reading, uh, Glissant as a thinker who is not wallowing in the you know, valley of melancholy, but who is sort of moving towards a future. And that's a fundamental misreading because yes, Glissant is definitely not wanting to get stuck in the past, right? His, his writing is always sort of constructive, visionary, right? Looking at future constructing of Martinique and Caribbean identity and so on. But at the same time, right? He never lets go of remembering, right? It's, that is constantly happening in Glissant, no matter what he's talking about. And he, he does that beautifully, right? In a way that doesn't create that dichotomy of either this or that. And this is something that needs to be explored and, and articulated more sophisticatedly uh, in the future. But, but I think he, he, he really uh, makes a great offering in terms of thinking about politics among many other ways, sort of going back to your question, Preston, of how do, how do you deal with that, right? Uh, like, mm -hmm. what are we, what's the political implications of, you know, grappling with, struggling with? And that critique of Bredotti, that was something that really stuck out to me, mm -hmm. um, is maybe, again, like overly enthusiastic, right? And it's right. similar to the Zizekian move. But I mean, you know, for those of us who are sort of, our principal concerns are, you know, existential and, ethical. This part stuck out to me. You, you write, the question that arises is, should not the call for accountability and mourning for the loss and suffering of others precede the joyful celebration of freedom and nomadic ontology? Mm -hmm. Should not the question of the other be at the center of ethics rather than a preoccupation with the self's mm -hmm. endless becoming? And I sort of, uh, you know, I felt like in a sense, uh, maybe that was written for someone like me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Who, who I can have a tendency to sort of overemphasize uh, the existential over the ethical, uh, perhaps mm -hmm. we could say. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, do you find that's a common misappropriation by Western interpreters of Deleuze? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Um, I, 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 it's hard to prescribe whether like what is a, a an appropriate use of Deleuze and what is not just because of obviously the sheer depth of Deleuzean writing but at the same time because of the 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 nature of his thinking uh, which just like leaves so much room for interpretation um, and appropriation so I don't know if it's actually a in a misappropriation and to, and to me, honestly, that is sort of the limit of Deleuzean thinking because precisely his writing and, 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 and thought is so... Intentionally opaque. <laughs> right, obviously, intentionally <laughs> opaque and confusing, but at the same time, uh, decontextualized from historical specificity which I think on the one way, you know, adds so much potential to it, right? So that you can now 
adopt the loose start and apply to, you know, ecological criticism, animal studies, queer theory, right, and, and post-colonial theory, and so on and so forth. But at the same time, right, I am always highly skeptical of any form of thought that, you know, places itself beyond and above historical specificity. Yeah, I mean, that's one of Zizek's critique of Deleuze. You know, he's, he says you can read whatever you want. Uh, you can get whatever you want out of Deleuze because of that, uh, that aspect of his, of his writing. But, I mean, one of the things that you write for going back to Glissant is uh, that for the Caribbean intellectual, uh, mm-hmm. it, it's, the, it's the historical memory of an obliterated past Mm-hmm. Um, but also the present reality of people and their collective identity, which presents a dilemma mm-hmm. because here is a history of a people whose very birth was given by a violent rupture, a mm-hmm. traumatic experience of dislocation, deportation, mm-hmm. and mass death. And that makes me think, you know, living here in the U S where we're, you know, all too aware of the ongoing history of, of racism and um, the connections there. Like, how do you think about this issue? Are there sort of helpful parallels um, or, or important differences between the, uh, the negritude movement and black liberation thought more broadly, or like, how do you think about something like, like black lives matter? If you can rephrase that question one more time. Yeah. So just like thinking that issue through your post-colonial mm-hmm. lens, sort of, uh, bringing those thinkers, those, those negritude thinkers to bear on that issue. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and maybe that's, maybe we can sort of like, like you were just saying, mm-hmm. being skeptical of, of readings that don't sort of like hit the ground. Mm-hmm. How, how would you see your work being taken up mm-hmm. by a community that is dealing with these sorts of issues mm-hmm. uh, here in the U.S.? Right. Obviously, you believe that there is a, a lot of parallel there going on, not in terms of the just only like the details of the historical incidents, right? But also the way that that very past structures uh, the social life of a population through history and, and how that very much shapes the contours of, let's say, the African-American you know, social life in the present. And so in that sense, I think I resonate with uh, Sylvester Johnson, who calls slavery a, a form of an internal colonialism. So, so, so in that regard, right, in, in the African-American context here in the U.S., you can raise a similar point by saying that, you know, it, it really is not just a, a past that's disconnected to what's going on in the present, but this is something that's sort of ingrained that sort of haunts uh, the edifice or the, the, the social fabric texture of existence of a population going back to hundreds of years ago. And that very history needs to be interpreted constantly in the present as we grapple with the different issues that contemporary political movements are dealing with, such as the Black Lives Matter, right? So that long history of slavery, of, of you know, all the atrocious e- events that's uh, marking the history of this country should be constantly read, interpreted uh, in light of, of the present. And, and these two are sort of kind of like how frequently sound, right? That traumatic past and the present that's born out of non history are inseparable, go hand in hand. I think it's the same thing is true for the African American history and, and, and politics in the present. I don't know if that answers. Yeah, it just it, it seems to me it, it gets into this notion of poetics. And from what you've been saying, Antai, it sounds like if you're not reconceptualizing, but remembering the past, continually mm-hmm. bringing the past to bear on your present, you're able to reimagine new possibilities for the future. It's this dialectic mm-hmm. between, you know, remembering the past, understanding the middle, and in this case, the middle passage on the Atlantic slave trade, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and always bringing that to bear for a new future. So I'm wondering... Um, to kind of take it away from like a less of a liberationist perspective, but what are the radical implications of like just how you think about it on an everyday basis? Maybe this uh, is just a reformulation of mass question. It, it might be, but. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's a great question. Um, like I said, the, the work or my work, my writing is sort of really dealing with um, epistemological framework, right? The ways mm -hmm. of thinking about knowledge and knowing and, and, and producing uh, knowledge. So, so really sort of the way that I apply to my own everyday politics as somebody who is in the world of academia and spends most of his time dealing with teaching and, and knowledge producing is sort of rethink a, a constant, relentless sort of anti-colonial politics, right? That can start at my own personal level. I sort of willingly and unapologetically uh, made the claim, I guess, to myself that this really is something that takes a lifelong work of, you know, theorizing, right? Like, I don't want to prescribe, you know, an, an easy measure for something that will be contradicting what I've been saying so far. And it's, right. it's, it's something that really makes me rethink, uh, you know, the way that I envision my work and the political implications of it. And I, I definitely want to uh, grapple more, work more with around the idea of affect, negative affect, trauma theory, and, and finding ways of incorporating that into what I do. And also, I mean, just like a, a, a more easy or practical sort of answer to that is like the way that I look at the world, right? I, I, I do actually am pretty preoccupied with trauma. <laughs> with yeah. actual trauma of, you know, refugees, immigrants, and people who are uh, marginalized in the system of structural oppression. Yeah. If we keep pulling on that thread of trauma, because that does seem mm -hmm. like something that kind of runs throughout. And mm -hmm. then, as you just said, you know, insofar as your, your work is one that's rethinking an epistemological framework, mm -hmm. Right. If we keep pulling on that thread of trauma that seems that coincides with the, the the figure of the abyss and the and the subject's passage and all that, and you know, I don't want to necessarily say cuts across, but like kind of moves within this middle passage within the abyss. Mm -hmm. um, there there is an unnameability to that to that experience, mm -hmm. um, and that's something you write about the unnameability of this trauma. Mm -hmm. um, in the wake of that, this is where you want to point towards the theopoetic. And then you sort of like, you bring in theopoetics and counterpoetics. So, uh, and it's not, it's not, as you say, it's, it's not something programmatic mm -hmm. or prescriptive, but mm -hmm. what is the, I don't know, this is probably not the right word, but the redemptive mm -hmm. aspect of theopoetics into your way of, of thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Glissant, like I said, is a, and I hate this uh, label, is a secular thinker, right? In the sense that he's not coming from an explicitly religious background, writing, you know, on religion and theology or God or, you know, whatever. Uh, and yet, I, I guess the way that I'm trying to, I mean, there's multiple moves here that I'm making, I think one way that I am bringing theopoetics into the picture is because precisely one of the central concerns of the book is to rethink the relation between theology or theological and, and the political, right? The theological and the political or the mystical way of thinking and the political way of thinking. I thought that uh, A, uh, that even though Glissant is not, you know, doing theology in, in the conventional theological sense, that his counterpoetics, his political poetics, sort of defies, in a way, deconstructs that whole uh, binary of what is the political. And, and from the perspective of the colonial Caribbean, right, what is the political and what is um, the sacred, right? Like that whole distinction is completely um, nonsensical from the perspective of the Caribbean. They, they, they're one and the same, you know, in so many ways. So uh, his poetics that's directed to the work of piecing, I mean, bringing these fragments and pieces together to, in order to reconstruct a future 
that's so elusive, that's so impossible, right, is very theological in, in a way, even when he's not drawing on theological language. And, and, and then at the same time, um, I was sort of wondering what it would be like to, to sort of put theopoetics into dialogue or to, to look at theopoetics from the perspective of Glissant's, you know, French Martinique, where in both occasions you have, you know, Glissant and this theopoetic thinkers who are equally grappling, struggling with the with unnameability, which in the in the context of theopoetics is grounded in or influenced by Derrida in many cases, but obviously it's got a much deeper root in, in the tradition of negative theology, right? Uh, and Glissant, who is really not drawing on any of those sources, right, sort of employs a very similar pattern of thought in dealing with the unnameability of historical trauma in the past. And so I was sort of trying to push, in a way, theopoetics towards that sort of decolonial political angle for the same reason, not the same reason, but for a similar reason that I was reading Hegel. Uh, I mean, Hegel and also Zizek, right? Uh, so what kind of political, what kind of politics, right, does a, a theopoetics uh, that's so preoccupied with the existential but disconnected with the uh, with the lived uh, reality, political struggle of uh, marginalized communities. It's like, what what is that missing? What kind of politics is that generating? And I'm not saying that all theopolitics, uh, uh, theopolitics does that, but there there is certainly a tendency uh, when you think about theopolitics that like the dominant ideas and voices tend to be, you know, grounded in in highly uh, Eurocentric, white Christian, Protestant, post-structuralist ideas. And so I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to challenge that and, and to sort of look at the, the possible politics that you can draw when you look at the counter poetics that someone like Lisang is writing, which is sort of envisioning a future that's not sort of erupting that's not sort of you know dropping down from <laughs> heaven or from the messianic future but one that slowly painfully emerges right that messianism that you're mm -hmm. that you mentioned at one point you are uh somewhat uh i, I don't want to say critical but you know uncomfortable with mm -hmm. uh, caputo's uh theology of the event and that sort of thing and i that was one of those moments where i was like Huh. I never really saw it from that colonial uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, like, I, I only bring it up because I'm just like curious. He was the, I, I noticed he was the editor. Yeah, he <laughs> is. <laughs> I'm sure there was like, you know, some, some measure of like back and forth. Did he, did he respond to that to you? Like, did you guys have a conversation about that? I thought no, that was we, like, we, we actually didn't have a conversation about it explicitly, but I was at a, on a different panel I, I was responding to his book, The Insistence of God. And I think I was raising a similar question, but framed in a different way. And, and we had a pretty good conversation about it, which unfortunately, my memory is failing. Um, Too young for that. <laughs> <laughs> at the moment. But uh, no, I, I mean, for a really long time, I was very much intrigued and, and fascinated by Jack Caputo's reading of Derrida, his mm. notion of the event and his theopoetics, which I find uh, highly compelling. And, and then it was actually not until I read Glissant that it sort of struck me, right? Sort of the, the parallel, the, the similarity of the language that both thinkers are employing and, and it's, you know, it, it's in, in so many ways so similar, uh, but sort of they are heading to sort of two different directions. And so that's when it kind of hit me and I was sort of pushing back against Caputo's, uh, you know, notion of the event that is always yet to come, right? 
Um, right, because it's sort of the uh, the incoming, the externality of that um, mm-hmm. is, uh, as I read it, is um, too too closely associated with the colonial event. Right, and, and to be fair, right, I'm I'm not the first person who is making this critique. I mean, okay. Capu- Caputo has dealt with actually my my mentor, <laughs> Catherine Keller's yeah. uh, critique of it. So they, I think, had a public conversation about it in print somewhere where um, Keller keeps sort of raising this question of, you know, her sort of uneasiness with this sort of erupting, you know, this, the messianicity, the sort of almost like violent nature of this event that sort of, you know, comes from, from outside, right? Um, mm-hmm. And so Keller was making a, a feminist critique of it. And so, yeah, I should say that in a way, you know, my reading of Caputo is also informed by, by that critique that Catherine Keller has raised a while ago. Yeah. This is a, like, well, it's, it made me think this is somewhat unrelated, but um, <laughs> there was this, there was one time they were in dialogue. It was probably like on Homebrewed or something like this. And uh, Caputo is doing his whole God doesn't exist, he insists mm-hmm. thing. And she's like, well, if God insists, on existing, I, I would let her. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I don't know. I really like that. <laughs> that but anyway, like- <laughs> yeah, you, you say that the, the process of constructing a cosmopolitical theology is mm. perennially accompanied by destruction. Right. It's making is in its unmaking, an open mm. project, always becoming, always creolized. Mm-hmm. Can you say what you mean there? Because that sort of reminds me of uh, Nietzsche, you know, who speaks about the inseparable union of creator and destroyer and mm-hmm. somewhere, somewhere there in Zarathustra, I think he's talking about that stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, he's just not someone you really invoke in the book until the end where you, you know, mention his famous bit about staring into the abyss. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't know, is Nietzsche an important thinker to you at, at all? Uh, I mean, I, I always enjoy reading Nietzsche, but I don't think I'm really using much of his work in yeah. this particular book. But in a way, actually, Derrida, who is not too uh, distant from Nietzsche, you know, theoretically speaking, I think evokes this whole idea of uh, construction of... Co- actually, when he was actually, he has this book on Cosmo... Poetanism, right? And forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And I think he kind of talks about that as well, uh, where he says that uh, cosmopolitanism, the construction of post cosmopolitanism needs to be accompanied by. I'm not saying that I uh, pleasurize there with that. I don't think I used his words exactly, but I think it was informed in a way by what Derrida was, was, was talking about, particularly that, that particular passage. But uh, yeah. But I guess what I was thinking as I was writing that chapter is the idea of any form of anti-colonial leftist uh, or liberal politics, uh, the, the, the danger of those politics of reifying right, certain norms, certain uh, politics that might become themselves uh, regulative in a, in a problem, problematically normative way, right? And so that they sort of end up reproducing equally problematic structures uh, that prevent from uh, the, the really creative and new forms of, and let's call that careerized anti-colonial politics or cosmopolitics from emerging. Yeah. I mean, when we talk about the, the cosmopolitical, I mean, maybe we should get into that. You know, it's, I mean, it's there in the title. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. It's sort of the, it's sort of the horizon of, of the book. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I, it's a different sort of cosmopolitics though, right? It's, it's um, this, this part made me think about um, like Daniel Barber, uh, in his book, in his book on eminence, talks about how the point of giving attention to the particular, mm-hmm. you know, is to see how reality is not fully understood by uh, the ideas we already possess. 
Mm -hmm. You know, and that's, that's what's at stake here is not just the particular in itself, but to sort of invoke the theological, it's, it's a revelation, it's revelation vis-a-vis the particular that reveals Mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. that's not already given, right? Let's just think what's on thought. Mm-hmm. So the, the, like the revelatory nature of the particular and its, its ability to challenge the given mm-hmm. is in a sense already political. But I mean, how far can this take us toward sort of a, re- a reframed or reimagined mm-hmm. cos- cosmopolitics? Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I was certainly not uh, intending to create a, a new form of school of thought or politics uh, I guess cosmopolitics is my own take on the dominant forms of cosmopolitan discourse. Could we say that it's what you're trying to get at is a cos- form of cosmopolitanism just thought otherwise? Right, right. So it, it's, a, it's a take, it's a twist on cosmopolitanism and sort of you know, challenging the, the problematic politics of it which, as I say in the book, right, takes politics for granted oftentimes. And it's very much framed by this uh, first, first world elitist, um, what's the other word I was thinking about? Almost like Eurocentric, uh, liberal political vision. And so the way that I think I use cosmopolitics is kind of like brings the the different concepts ideas that i've been i was i'm debating in the discussing in the book together and i honestly don't have the right words to put that right and we just Mm -hmm. spent a whole lot of time talking about what the that politics would look like and what the political implications of it is right it's something that's yet to be developed not just by uh, myself, but also like I, I just don't see, you know, as as many models of such politics as I would like to. So I think it's it's a form of political vision that's taking shape currently. Uh, different innovative thinkers uh, from all over uh, are, I think, working towards honing right. Uh, honing this otherwise forgotten, muted, or silenced uh, forms of thought into a new form of politics, right? Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's just like the scope of it. It's so vast that I honestly don't have an easy way of putting them together. Uh, but to give you a quick example, um, Neil Roberts, who is teaching uh, at Williams College in, I believe, in political science and Africana studies, mm-hmm. has written a book uh, called Freedom as, as Maroonish. And so he sort of challenges, right, uh, the dominant discourse of, of freedom that shapes all the, you know, academic discourse of in political science and political theory, which is very much informed by, by liberalism. And he, he sort of raises a question of what if we reframe, reconfigure the notion of freedom from, or we look at the Maroons, right? Slaves flight from plantation as a, a new uh, way, new parameter for thinking, rethinking political subjectivity and freedom. And I think that is a great example of poetics, counter-poetics, counter-politics of, of sort of, you know, grappling with the past, not in just a, a, a conceptual, artistic, creative way, but in a, you know, very, you know, <laughs> highly, deeply theoretical, but at, at the same time, pragmatic and, and, and practical and political right way. I like that. It seems like it's uh, doing an archaeology of, of the voice from the other. Not you know, you're looking at time and history in a sense of like not just the genealogy of the families going back and forth, but you actually look getting into the earth, into the very substrata of for this, for instance, this notion of freedom, and mm-hmm. you look at different conceptualities of what freedom would look like or could look like outside of this liberal notion of freedom, this political notion of freedom that that is the kind of the dominant discourse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And I think that is eventually what cosmic politics will entail, right? It's constantly rethinking, deconstructing and reconstructing, you know, decolonial and anti-colonial politics. Well, I think maybe that's a good place to stop. Mm-hmm. I want to read a bit from the, the end of your book. I like this, this passage. You write, the poetics of resistance calls us from the abyss. It invites us back to the abyss again, teaching us how to live with this groundlessness, to live in rootlessness, in exile, with contradictions, loss, ambiguities, trauma, always creolizing and in oscillation between multiple points of signification, with an openness to the mystery and the abyss of the other. Cosmopolitics solicits the ethical responsibility to embrace the loss of one's own self before the other, to do, undo, and be undone by this other. Cosmopolitical theology affirms the power of the people who, however fractured, fragmented, traumatized, or displaced, gather themselves and begin and thus rebuild the cosmos from the ruin. Within this cosmopolitical scheme, the name of the divine cannot be restricted to the realm of the unnameable, divorced from the political struggle of the community. Rather, the unnameable name of the divine then denotes the very condition of abyssal ruin from which we construct a decolonized cosmopolitan future and a new creolized name of God. So, Yunse, thanks for being on the uh, podcast. Thank you so much, Matt and Preston. It was a real pleasure talking to you.